Want to achieve network marketing success? Then you're in the right company. Hello, and welcome to Leave Nothing to Chance, hosted by networking marketing giant, John Solider. Learn everything you need to know about the network marketing space from somebody who's actually done it. Join us every week for front row seats as we feature some of the finest and most successful personalities in network marketing. Leave nothing to chance. Join us now. Welcome to our December 21st, 2001 Christmas show. And we're going to talk about money today. And Keith Hooper is kind enough to join us to kind of uh, do my normal job of uh, asking questions uh, and to set this up. And, you know, Keith, we're living in interesting times. Don't need to tell anybody that. They know it, right? Whether you're concerned with your financial future or not, you want to listen to what we're going to talk about today. And um, we're going to talk about debt and how it restricts growth in so many different ways. And we're going to talk about what to do with money as you make it, uh, what I call the four primary needs of most families today. So we're going to talk about a lot of stuff in about the next 45 minutes or so. And uh, just sit back, take notes, and enjoy the process. This is something that is in my wheelhouse, so to speak. I've been, uh, as some of you know, I spent some time in the life insurance industry. I was a licensed agent for one of the largest insurance companies in the world. Uh, I also held securities licenses for the oldest mutual fund company in the world. So that doesn't mean I'm qualified to give you financial advice. I'm not anymore. I'm not licensed anymore. But we can work around the edges a little bit and give you, you know, some things that you can chew on here as we get into the new year, just kind of some food for thought uh, to retire some debt and also to uh, to grow and why you don't want to grow. So, Keith, uh, how are you today? I'm good, John. You know, as you were talking about today's show, I was thinking about a couple of things. You know, when I was a very young man, and that means the middle part of the last century when I was a young man, okay, you went to school. And they had a savings account program at school, in the public school. You had this little booklet. You opened up a savings account, and you put a, a little bit in there. Maybe it was a dollar. Maybe it was 50 cents. Maybe it was, you know, goodness gracious, might have been as much as $5 you put in there. And I think a lot of people think about finances in the way is, you know, well, you know, I don't have $1,000 to put into something. I don't have $10,000 to put into a savings account. And... You know, one of the things that you're going to cover today is that that part of time plus consistency is what sets you free. It's that time plus consistency. And I know you're a master at that. You've taught it for, for many, many years. So I hope people take the time to listen here because this is a process. It's not it's not one thing you do one time. It's that process, John, and you're masterful at teaching that. So, uh, you know, if you would share with people a little bit of those concepts about that long term, consistent effort, if you will, or that consistent savings or that consistent investment and how that can change their lives. Well, I think we got to look at, at our good uh, friend, Dr. Albert Einstein, and the fact that Einstein said that his most important discovery was compound interest tables. It was not the theory of relativity that most people attribute to, to him, and, and it was, was one of his discoveries, but compound interest tables. When he figured out how money compounded, he felt like it was his most important discovery. And that's really what we're talking about. You know, it's it said, and, I, and I've seen people, and I've been in network marketing now, April will be 39 years, Keith. So I've, like yourself, been around this game a long time, known a lot of people, known a lot of million dollar earners who today are flat broke. How do you make a million dollars and be flat broke? Spend a million one, plain and simple. Outkick your coverage, overspend, live beyond your means. You know, I go back to my beginnings in life as a youth. And my father, who was a working guy, my dad was a blue collar guy, who was a union electrician in New Jersey, roughest profession in some ways, right? Worked with electricity every single day, but kind of on the high end of the food chain in the blue collar world. But he used to quote the guy who was his business agent, this is a guy named Renz, that when he was an apprentice, Mr. Renz told him and the other apprentice electricians not to have what, what they used to call, uh, you know, Cadillac dreams with a beer budget. 
And what did that mean? You know, I didn't understand that when I was 11 or 12 years old. But what that meant, what Mr. Wrench meant was, you have no means being a working guy going out buying a caddy. Now, when you retire, maybe, but during your working years, be practical. That was a good idea. We've seen through the years books pop up, like The Millionaire Next Door. And you find that the millionaire next door is normally living in a normal house. He's not living in the biggest house in town. He's not driving three Cadillacs and, and two Ferraris. And he may be able to afford to do so, but he doesn't do it. Very, very practical with money. Now, you may ask yourself why. That's the fundamental question, why. If I was to go to a young person, for example, I have an 18-year-old and a 17-year-old living in my house. And if I was to go to them and say, what do you do with a dollar? And by the way, my kids could tell you what to do with a dollar. They could tell you how to spend a dollar too, but they could also tell you what to do with one because they're very cognizant of some of the things and uh, ideas and principles that, that they've grown up with. What would you do with a dollar? Well, the first 10% of it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. You tithe it. You give it away. If you're not a religious person, you're not affiliated with a church or synagogue or mosque, okay, give it to your favorite charity. Give it to the local ambulance corps or Little League. You do what you want with it, but it doesn't belong to you. I grew up with that thinking. 10% of my income wasn't mine. I was always giving it away, still do to this day, okay? Now, what about the next 30%? The next 30% roughly is what you call your Caesar account. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. That's not my words. That's Jesus Christ's words. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. About 30% of your income belongs to the federal government here in the United States and Canada. Okay, might be higher than that, might be lower than that, depending on, on how your you know, tax person does your taxes. But about 30% doesn't belong to you either. It belongs to your federal government. If you live in a state or a province with high taxes, well, some of it belongs to them. So it's not really yours. So you say, wow. In the first five minutes of this call, Solider, you just told me 10% I got to give away and 30% is not mine. Great. That still leaves 60. What do you do with that other 60%? Let's allocate it properly. Cost of living, about 30%. So now we're up to what? 70%. What about that other 30%? That other 30%, 15 to 20% of it needs to go back into your business. If you are actively building a network marketing business, or for that matter, I know I've got listeners that are not in network marketing. Some of them are in different professions. You need to put that money back into your business. You need to reinvest in you and your business, okay? And in that investment, by the way, okay, some of that needs to be self-development. You need to buy the books. You need to listen to the tapes. You need to go to the seminars. You need to continue to self-educate in that money that you put back into your business. Okay, we still have 10% left. That's where I want to really start the discussion today. That 10% left, that is to retire debt, number one. If you have debt, the bank owns you, you don't own the bank. Okay? That 10%, whatever it happens to be. Now, my recommendation is sit down with all your household bills. Your credit card bill is probably going to be the highest number in terms of interest rate, but it may not be. You might have a school loan, for example, that some people have. You, you might have some other outstanding debt to a, a medical uh, situation. You might, you know, whatever. I mean, you, you know what you have. You sit down with those bills. And whatever the highest interest rate one is, is the one you got to attack with that 10%. Let's say that you owe $1,000 to your doctor for some procedure he did that wasn't covered by your insurance. Well, that $1,000 you need to pay off because you might be paying 15, 16, 18, 20% on that bill. You might have some other bill. Once again, you, you know the bill. You'll find the bill. Unfortunately, you'll find the bill. You know what I'm talking about. You, you got them there. You got them in your stack on your desk, folks. Okay. You don't know. I'm not making this stuff up. Okay. I got them too, but we pay them off all the time when they come immediately. Why is that? Because the highest interest rate one is the one that's going to choke you out quicker than any other bill that you have. It's going to accumulate. For example, as a segue, there was a study done a number of years ago, about around the time when I first came down here to Texas, uh, it's about 25 years ago. And I'll never forget that study. And Keith, you might remember this, that $200 a month was the amount of money that caused people to go into bankruptcy in the state of Texas. And I said, wow, 
two hundred dollars. I mean, what's a, what a big deal? Two hundred dollars. Come on, you can borrow that from your, your you know from your next door neighbor or one of your kids, right? Not a big deal. Well, it is a big deal because here's what happens. In January, it's two hundred. And if it's at a high interest rate, for example, on a credit card, February comes, it's another 200 plus the interest on the initial 200. So let's call that about 20%. Okay, so not $200, that's another $40 roughly in accumulated interest. So now at the end of February, you owe the new 200 in February, the initial 200 in January, that's 400. The interest from January, there's another 40. So now you're up to 440. Now let's go to March. Another 200, 640, plus the interest from February, plus the accumulated interest from January. Now you're up to about 700. You see where I'm going with this? It doesn't take long before it's several thousand dollars that you owe. Thus, these families were declaring bankruptcy over a lack of $200 a month. Now, if you're in network marketing, you know how to make that $200, folks. The word's called retail. It might be a dirty word to you called retail. Get off your butt and go sell some product to somebody, okay? Or somebody's. Take your product, whatever your product is, get it out in the marketplace. That's going to build your downline anyway. It's going to help you to recruit people who are satisfied when they take your product that they like the product. But more than that, that exercise is going to get you into the discipline of never having a high interest rate bill that you can't pay. And anytime you accumulate one for whatever reason, you have the opportunity to go out, sell some product, and satisfactorily take care of that debt. Now, I've taught this for over 35 years to people. Some people got it. And here's what's funny. Some of those people, Keith, were not the top earners in the industry. You know, I've, I've trained a lot of the top earners in the industry. Some of them are the worst with money. Some of the people who got it are what I call the middle-level distributors, the people who said, I get it. And they paid off that debt. And then once they paid off that debt, they said, all right, what's the next one? And what's the next one? For example, I had a, a strength coach and his wife that I trained back here in the 1990s with a company here in Dallas. And that strength coach and his wife had just gotten married. They, uh, they had a lot of debt. And what they started to do was they would take whatever the debt was of the moment and they'd hang it on the refrigerator. So they both had to look at it every time they went for something to eat. And one by one, they paid those bills off. Well, they became one of the top distributorships in that particular company. And today, that fellow actually owns a company in the industry uh, because he got it. He got the discipline of what to do to pay off that debt. Now, well, wait a minute, John. I, I've got to, got to interrupt you here because you've got some real nuggets here. And I hope people listen carefully. So I want everybody to take a deep breath because that first segment that you covered is... You know, I can't live on my total check that I got coming into the house right now. And now you're telling me to give away 10%. You're telling me to set aside 30% for Caesar. You're telling me to reinvest in my business. You're telling me all of this. But the caveats that are important, this is why you're listening to this podcast. This is why you're leaving nothing to chance. This is why you started that home-based business. So the money that you're talking about here, because you and I have seen this, John, in network marketing. People get in network marketing, they have that, that flowering of success in the beginning, and they think it's going to go forever, and they don't cut back, their, they don't maintain their same lifestyle. They add to it. They get a second car, they buy a boat, they take trips to Hawaii, they do all the things that are there. So what you're talking about is that first initial income that you're making from your business here is where you're focusing on 10% to charity, 30% to Caesar, another 30% that you can add to your lifestyle if you want to, but that other 30% and 10% and or 20% and 10% for debt, get that debt retirement, use this income that you're going to make out of this home-based business, this, this additional stream of income, John, which is what is so powerful here to be able to retire those debts, because it's awfully nice to wake up in the morning and you're going, well, you know, maybe I'll go to work today. Maybe I won't, you know, whatever, because you're out of debt. And that, I think, is the important part that people get here. So when you're talking about this, so everybody take a deep breath, relax a little bit. Not only is John going to tell you how to give away money, okay, to charity, your 10%, but about making additional money, increasing the stream of income, John. 
Okay, so what happens? Now let's segue. You get the discipline of paying the debt. And now the debt, maybe all the debt's gone. Some of the debt's gone. Maybe you keep your mortgage. Maybe you keep your car payments if they're at low interest rates. Okay, those are decisions you'll make with your spouse. Or if you're single, you'll make them on your own. Let's talk about now what to do with that 10%, because that's really what I want to focus on, what to do with that 10%. Now, I know networkers, once again, 39 years experience. I know networkers who go out and do everything Keith just described. They buy the second car, but the second car is not a good secondhand used car from the car lot. It's a Maserati. It's a Porsche. It's a Ferrari. Hey, listen, I'm, I'm a car guy. I love cars. Okay. Don't own any of them. Okay. I own practical vehicles. Why? I can go and rent for a day any of those cars I just mentioned if I really want to drive one. But I don't need to own them because they're not a good investment, quite frankly. Okay. Second to that, your home. Live where you live. Now, if you live in a place and you've got holes in the wall and leaky pipes, fix the stuff up by all means. But if you're living somewhere, you don't have to upgrade to the next neighborhood over to impress anyone. One of the big mistakes in network marketing is people try to impress other people. For what purpose? I, I, I will never, ever, 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 ever figure out. Okay. Somebody said to me one time, who do you need to impress, Solider? Because they look at me, I, I dress like a very normal person and I could afford to dress a lot better, but I dress as a very normal person. I don't wear jewelry. I don't like jewelry, frankly. I'm not a jewelry guy. Okay, I wear a watch. I wear a sports watch, frankly. I wear an Apple sports watch so it tracks my steps because that helps me with my fitness and, and my health. I don't wear a Rolex. Can I afford a Rolex? Absolutely. I can afford 100 Rolexes. Don't need them. Don't want them. I'll just lose them anyway. Okay, so why would I have something like that when a Timex tells the same time as a Rolex? You be practical with your money because what to do with that 10% is critical to build a financial fortress around yourself and your family in the years to come. So I believe, Keith, that there's four basic areas I want to touch on here. Let's look at a family that's got young children. Okay, they got young children. Every parent aspires or should aspire, I think, for their children to go to college or at least have that opportunity, right? When the, if, the, if your kid goes to school and Johnny or Susie, they go to school, they get good grades, they're good kids, they don't get themselves in trouble with drugs or other things, okay? And they come to you when they're 17, 18 years old and they say, Mom, Dad, I want to go to Harvard. I want to go to Stanford. I want to go to Yale. I want to go to McGill. I want to go to wherever it happens to be. The last thing you want to as, as a parent want to be in a position to do is to say, you did your job, I did mine. Tell me which one you want to apply to or apply to them all. Okay, you make the choice when they all accept you. If the kids do their job, mom and dad, you need to do your job. And out of that 10%, what you need to do instead of buying the Rolex, instead of buying the Ferrari, instead of taking the expensive trip, is you need to put money into what's called a 529C. If you live here in the United States, Canada, I know, has the equivalent. Some states, by the way, okay, a lot of the states here in the U.S. offer programs as well. You can invest in. I'm not telling you where to invest your money. I'm telling you the, the discipline of investing it in some financial vehicle that is for the education of your children. Now, most of these things, by the way, are tax advantaged. Okay, what does that mean? It means the growth you're not paying income tax on every single year, et cetera, et cetera. The money is being deferred to later on until your kid uses it to go to school. Okay, that's 529C program. That's your college education fund. Once again, a lot of states have it. Check it out. Okay, that's not my job to tell you where to find it. You can have a financial planner or you have somebody in your community that's in the insurance business. They can guide the process on that. Very, very important to put that money away while you're making it. Now, if you're part-time in network marketing, and let's just say that you're making an extra couple thousand dollars a month, okay? You can take 500, 1,000, whatever it happens to be, and you can make monthly payments into that so that you don't even feel it. Check comes from your company, put a little away for Johnny and Susie's education fund. You won't even feel it. You're gonna love how it builds up. I've lived this, by the way, I've done this for my children. You're gonna love how it builds up. 
And once again, they're not going to get to 18 and you're going to say, where in the world am I going to find all of this money because they've been accepted to a school that might be 50, 60, $70,000 a year. Who knows what it's going to be? Okay, that's one thing. Next thing. Let's say you never married or perhaps you married, you never had children or perhaps you're in a situation uh, where your children are grown. Mine are almost grown. Keith's are, are, are grown. They're adults. He's, he's in the grandchild phase now where some of the grandchildren are even getting to be adults. If you're in that situation, how about your retirement? Now, Congress here in the United States and also the equivalent in Canada, I know, have set up things over the years that are once again tax advantaged for you to take money and take care of your future. Your government wants you to take care of your future. Don't rely on social security or the equivalent in Canada. It's very little money, frankly. If you look at what you put in over the years through your taxes and what you get back, it's, it's, it's disgusting, okay? Whatever it is, it is. You earned it, take it by all means, but it's not gonna be a full-time living, quite frankly, not even close. I got my thing a few weeks ago here in the mail because I turned 60 this year and, I looked at the number and I said, well, I'll take it, but couldn't live on it. Not, not in the lifestyle that, that we have. And we don't have a big lifestyle for the type of income that we make. And guess what? My sister, who's quite a bit older than me, she's in the same situation. She's still working because she's looking at hers and saying, it's just not enough. So that being the case, even if the government radically ups the numbers, it's still not going to be enough for you to continue in the home you're in, the cars you're in, the lifestyle that you probably have. So you've got to save for retirement. Now, a SEP, S-E-P, is what it's called here in the United States. It's a separate retirement account for self-employed people. Once again, check with your insurance agent. You can even check with your bank. In some cases, your bank has different things that they carry uh, along those lines. All right. Once again, put that money away for retirement. As a discipline, on the 2nd of January every year, there is a check in an envelope addressed to my insurance company that sits on my desk from about December 26th. And I get the privilege, and I call this a privilege, Keith, on January 2nd, every year to stick it in the mailbox and to mail it to Jack Jackson Life, happens to be the company that I use. Uh, and uh, I mail it to Jackson Life on the 2nd every year that that's my gift to myself every year is for my retirement account. And I've been doing this, by the way, since I'm 25. Now, you can imagine the money builds up. But whether you're 25 listening to this, 35, 45, 55, or even 65, it's not too late. You take some of that money that you're making from your multi-level business and you apply it to your retirement. Okay, so far, what have we covered? We've covered either education, if you've got younger children. If you're a grandparent, by the way, and you want to establish those, those uh, accounts for your kids, you can. The retirement account's the second step. Now, what's the third step? Third step is that we're living in a situation today where most people are going to live a lot longer than their parents did. I've already surpassed the age my father died at, for example. Now, my mom made it to 92, so we've got a ways to go on that, Keith. But you don't know how long you're going to be here for. One thing you don't want to be is a burden on your children. So how do you not be a burden on your children financially? You create what I call the third pillar, if you will, here of finance called a long-term care policy, LTC, long-term care. Once again, check with your insurance agent, check with your financial professional. All right. Don't check with your next door neighbor if they, you know, sell golf shoes for a living. Check with somebody who knows, who can advise you. There's a number of different products out there in long-term care. I have one. My wife has one. Why do we have that? We have that so that if either one of us need to go into a nursing home, that the money is there each month to pay for our nursing home. And I believe that right now we have it set for five years. Because if you go in one realistically, you probably won't be there more than five years. You'll be into the next life. But there's enough there that it's not going to drain my kids as they're living their lives, building their families of their resources to take care of mom and dad because we didn't do our job financially to set ourselves up for the situation that many Americans and Canadians find themselves in near the end of their lives where they wind up in a nursing home. OK, now it's a number of companies, once again, that have it. Some have a life insurance provision, too, so that if you never 
go to the nursing home and you pass away, that there's life insurance. Anyway, there's a lot of different products. I'm not here to endorse any one of them. Check them out, though, because once again, part of your financial stewardship to your family is to make sure that you don't burden the next generation with your debt. Okay, they didn't create it. You did. If you live long enough, and I hope you all do, and I hope we all pass away in a nursing home when we're 97. Some of us will, some of us won't. Who knows on that? No guarantees either way. But prepare financially for that time. Fourth step. And Keith, I know I've gone through this. I know you've gone through this. And I know friends of ours are going through it as we speak. Is the care of another elderly person in your family who didn't get this information that you're getting today. They didn't set up for living a long time. So this is what I call the rainy day fund of someone else, not necessarily you. Maybe you have an elderly aunt or uncle or parent or someone in your life who you've been close to, who for whatever reasons did not prepare properly for their future. And you may say, hey, I need to help out Uncle Joe here. Uncle Joe, maybe he never married, he had no kids and you're gonna help out Uncle Joe in his old age. That's kind of step four is that if you want to call it rainy day fun, so to speak, okay? We've all been there. Now, if you have an elderly parent, realistically, you're going to have to step up to the bar here at some point and write checks. Believe me, been there. That's just called reality of how we live today in North America. Great news is we live a long time. Bad news is we run out of money. Well, if you don't run out of money, that's great. But if an elderly person in your life does, you may have to help them out. And if you don't, great. Hey, more money for you if it doesn't turn out that way. But this way, once again, you're prepared and it's not, wow, I did everything right, I'm ready for retirement, but my wife's uncle who didn't prepare has a problem and we feel like it's incumbent on us to help them, okay? Could be somebody in your community. Whatever it happens to be, once again, you deal with that situation. I'm not telling you how to live your life or spend your money, but this is reality of finance. Now, Keith, notice what I didn't tell these people. I didn't tell them to go out as we talked earlier, buy a fancy car, buy a Rolex, buy the most expensive suit or dress in the, in the store, go out and flaunt your wealth to your neighbors because they're going to join your business. Because reality is they're not. Today, people think differently. Today, people have a, a social thought, for the most part, how they do things. People don't want to see you flaunt your wealth. They, most people would rather have you tell them the kind of things that I'm telling you and have real frank discussions about finance than, hey, look at my brand new whatever. That might be well and good, but that's not going to impress them enough to necessarily join your business. It'll show you're making money, but it shows that you are not a good steward of money to a person who you want in your business. The people you want in your business are people who think that way, that this is a business of preparation financially for future need. And therefore, let me get in and sh now show me once I'm in how to make that thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars a month part time with my my side gig, so to speak. I like that terminology. I got that from uh, our friend Randy Gage side gig. OK, it's great terminology. Call it what you want, your side hustle. Anyway, all that being the case, you got those four principles. First thing, retire your debt. Next thing, look at those four areas. And by the way, no matter how old you are, no matter what, what ethnicity you are, no matter what sex you are, no matter what religion you are or aren't listening to this, I'm sure you can identify with one or more of those financial four needs that I described there. That's the way to start thinking. And that's the way, Keith, too, as I look at all the folks that I know in the industry over these 39 years, the really successful ones are not flamboyant. The really successful ones are very, very practical, much like the millionaire next door type of people in that book where, yeah, they're, they've been making a lot of money from their company, but a lot of money is not necessarily that they're even at the top rank in their company, but they consistently have good financial discipline with the money that they do make and they put it away. Good friend of mine in the industry, Jeff Weisberg, his dad, Herb Weisberg, was a uh, agent with um, uh, Northwest Mutual for many years out of California. And uh, Herb and I, 
we used to have a lot of conversations about this uh, when I was younger and when we'd spent some time together. And uh, Herb always said, John, it's not what you make, it's what you keep. Well, that's good advice. Questions or comments, Keith? Well, you know, John, great information. I hope everybody got here. Now, this is not your happy right before Christmas, you know, leaving nothing to chance call. Okay. <laughs> But you know, every once in a while, whether you like it or not, you got to touch reality. And I think what's important here, John, is you've got the every you gave everybody a real reality check on what needs to be done, but they need to be listening to leaving nothing to chance because in the world we live in today, you need to develop multiple streams of income. And that, in my opinion, one of those streams of income needs to be through a network marketing model. Okay, because it allows you to, to leverage your time and your talents to, to increase, to create a stream of income. And then from that stream of income, you have some options. So, you know, everything you talked about here touched the point of what you need to do. But like I say, so often people look at those credit card debts and they go, oh my goodness, I'll never get it paid off. Well, yeah, you will. Okay. And one of the other things that you, that you touched up on is that financial, you know, being cognizant of how you spend your money. What I find fascinating is the broker people are the more credit cards they have. Okay. I mean, I, I literally, I know people got 15 credit cards, 15 credit cards. Are you kidding me? Why would you need 15 credit cards? Oh, cause you can't pay them off. Okay. Otherwise you don't need 15. Look, if you got an American express, a MasterCard and visa, you're good to go. You know, maybe you don't need all three. Okay. But beyond that, Really? You know, so once again, think about that. The consciousness that John is bringing up here as you know, obviously there's not much cheer on this call, but there's a lot of good news on this call. Okay. The good news is, is there is a way. And that way is develop that, that income, develop that, that, that stream of income. Network marketing needs to be one of those streams of income, whether you like it or not, as our governor here in California said, whether you like it or not, okay, so, and I do it in a little nicer way than that, whether you like it or not, you need to develop that stream of income, multiple streams of income, rental income is great, but you got to have the money to start the process of buying rental property, you got to income, dividend income is great, but you got to have the way to invest to buy the, to buy the stock that pays the dividends, you got to have that, so the easiest way to do that is start your home-based business, leaving Nothing to chance is a tool that will educate you in a way where you can take the time plus effort and it equals success. That's what you've got here with this, you know, university of education of building a stream of income in network marketing, working from home with what you have here with John Solider and leaving nothing to chance. So, uh, John, I did the pitch for you on this today, but uh, I'm listening to no more. Well, I, I want to list, I want to add a couple other things because life is the best teacher and you can't have all the lessons yourself. It just doesn't work that way, right? So here were a couple of life lessons for me when I was very, very, very young uh, in the business, that is. I was already an adult. But um, my first company had a problem with the Food and Drug Administration and, and the media for that matter. This was back in 1984. Some of you know the company, still in business. So they had a great comeback and now they do about 8 billion a year, but they had a problem. And um, I would go to meetings in Saddlebrook, New Jersey at the Saddlebrook Marriott. If any of you from that area of the country, Saddlebrook Marriott's still there, I think. I haven't been there in a long time. But that's where I used to go to my, my first meetings in network marketing. And I'll never forget that the top producers had all been driving Jaguars and Mercedes and, and, you know, you'd go to the meetings and it was like a fashion show. The women were dressed to the nines and the guys who had the most expensive suits and jewelry. And within about 90 days of that company having that difficulty with the Food and Drug Administration, those cars became used Volkswagens. <laughs> all the glitz and glamour was gone. And it was a valuable lesson. And I wasn't a big earner, by the way. I was just, you know, a struggling young guy making a little bit of money in the business. But I observed that because I observed everything. And I was trained to be a reporter. That's my, my training at university. And I observed that. And I said, wow. And I got into the life insurance business after that because, frankly, I wasn't making a living. So I needed to do something out of the life insurance business. And insurance 
was a great trainer for me, Keith, because I sat in front of people who are now the ages that you and I are, a little bit younger, a little bit, you know, in our age group, 50s, 60s, even 70s. And I would go to their homes. And in those days, of course, there were no cell phones. And I would, would sit there and I would ask them questions. I had this thing I had to fill out with them and, and I'd have them tell me their stocks, their bonds, their mutual funds, their real estate holdings, if they had any, uh, their annuity or their pension from work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I would accumulate all of that data. I would take it back to our office and I would feed it into this humongous Honeywell computer that we had and it would give me a report that I would then take back to that hopeful customer of mine and say, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, here's where you're at. And I'll never forget this. It was in a town called Halden, New Jersey. And I remember Halden, New Jersey, only because Bruce Bumgartner, our greatest Olympic wrestler from the U.S., is from Halden, New Jersey. Anyway, I went to this couple in Halden, New Jersey one night, and they lived in a beautiful home. And I had to tell them that there was no way in the world in retirement. They were about 60 at the time. That no way in the world in retirement could they continue to live in that home based on what they had saved. They had a beautiful home. They had nice cars. They had nice furniture. But the reality was they were not going to be able to live like they were living in retirement. So what do you do? Do you work till you drop? Well, you know, I don't know what they did ultimately. I, I wasn't staying in the business that long. That's why I didn't keep up with that particular couple. But I saw that movie. I also saw the movie of my own father dying without preparing financially and leaving my mother in a mess, quite frankly, that I helped with my sisters for her to get out of over a number of years. It's called life, folks. Okay. So when I say this stuff, it's not as a network marketer who's made a lot of money in network marketing. It's as a person who's observed a lot of people who've done it wrong and a lot of people who've done it right. Now, I've spent 39 years in this business and I've known multi million dollar earners who haven't saved in there. And something happens to their company, like what happened in 1984 with that particular company I was with. And they wind up almost destitute. Or they wind up multi-level junkies. They go in company to company to company and they sell the same story about how they used to be successful and a few people follow them. And most of the time they make bad choices. They don't join companies that have longevity to them. That's tragic. Don't be like those guys. Be like the guys that make money consistently in one company, whatever your company is. If you have a good company and you believe in your product, and you believe in your company, you believe in your pay plan, you believe in your management, your ownership, you believe in all that. And most importantly, you believe in you and you learn the business and you become a network marketing professional. That does not mean you have to be the top earner in your company, but it means you want that consistent income. The most consistent income earners in, in our industry in many cases, you don't know their names. You'll never know their names because they haven't gone to a second company. They haven't needed to. For example, a number of years ago, uh, my friend Stuart Johnson, owner of, of Video Plus, uh, now called Success Partners, Stuart hosted an event here for people who had made a certain amount of money in the income. And for disclaimer purposes, I won't say the amount, but it was a lot. And I was blessed to be in that group of, of people. And there were about nine guys that came in and I was with some of my colleagues that I did know in the industry and we're standing around and about nine guys come in with one particular company in the industry. And we're talking amongst ourselves, Keith. And I said, hey, I was talking to my friend, Jeff. He was uh, in that group also. I said, who are those guys? He goes, I have no idea. Well, those guys had been with a company since its inception and they've been with that company over 20 years. And a lot of them were older guys than, than we were at that time. We were in our 40s. A lot of them were in their 60s. They had been with one company. They weren't household words. Now, in their company, they were household words. But in the industry, you and I wouldn't know them. And if we said their name to most of the top earners in the industry, they never heard of them either. But I'll tell you what. They were making money. They're probably still making money today. They probably are. I know their company. They're still doing very, very well. That's what I'm talking about. Not jumping around company to company to company, find a company, build it, and then you have the financial discipline that we talked about today to take care of, their, take care of those four needs for your family. That's how you build a financial fortress. And you use the industry and your company and your opportunity to fund your financial future. And you will be successful the way that you want to be successful for your needs, not to impress the neighbors with the latest car or the latest whatever, okay? You do all of that, 
you're going to have a great life in network marketing. Like so many people that are nameless and faceless to most of us that make a great income on a consistent basis with real companies, real pay plans, real products, and they do it month in, month out, year in, year out for many, many years. Last example. I have what I call the 40 year plus club. Those are people who've made income for 40 years or more from one particular company in the industry. And there's a number of those companies out there that have been here 40 years or more. And you get around some of those people. I was in California a number of years ago. Um, I had helped to uh, work with something that wound up becoming an acquisition of a very large company in the industry. And um, the owner of the company, the owner of the company was my, my, my friend, uh, had me at the company's big annual shindig. And here I am, I'm working as a consultant for the company, okay, you know, the corporation, I'm not a distributor, I'm not in sales, I'm not in management, I've got an outside role helping this particular company. And um, we got to lunchtime. And at lunchtime, I looked for a place to sit to eat my lunch. And there's thousands of people at this particular event in San Francisco. So I go, oh, there's an empty seat. I'll go and I'll sit down and I'll eat my lunch like everybody else's. So I did that. And Keith, I sat with people. Now, this was 2005. I sat with people that had been in that company in some cases from the late 1950s and early 1960s before I was born, that they had started to earn income with that particular company, one of our old companies in the industry. And it got me thinking, this is a legacy business. Then I got around some of the younger people in that company and found out that their distributorships had been built by their mom and dad, or in some cases, even their grandma and grandpa that had left them in the will to these younger folks who know how to distributorships. Well, that's what you want. You want a business that lives on beyond you. If you build it right, and we're not in a teaching technique right now in terms of how to build an organization, but if you build it right, this becomes a legacy business for your family. The same way that those folks with that particular company have legacies for theirs. I and you have legacy, Keith, with the company we built together. I've interviewed some great people like my friend Joe Garcia yesterday. Joe has that legacy for his family, the company he's built, and other people that we've interviewed on Leaving Nothing to Chance where they have that legacy. So be that legacy. Be smart with your money. Invest today for tomorrow. That's my last message, Keith. Back to you. Well, John, thank you for allowing me to be here with you on this, uh, this Christmas season show. And we want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas, Happy Holiday season. Um, hope you all have a great time. But Joe, I know, uh, I know that, uh, Joe, I let the name out, but I know that you, uh, you have a great guest for next week here on Leaving Nothing to Chance. And so maybe you can give everybody just a little teaser why they want to, why they want to listen next week, John. Well, boy, on that December 28th show, folks, you're not going to want to miss it. Manifesting your success in 2022. Joe Garcia, such a gentleman, such a nice human being, so successful, so humble. Joe has put together a Christmas, New Year's, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa gift for everybody. It's free what he got on there and he's going to talk about. It. He'll tell you how to get that. So you got to listen to the podcast to find out. Okay. But uh, Joe is talking about some, some things that uh, once again are just going to help to bless you and your family in 2022. So you want to definitely want to listen to next week's show and share it with your organization. And once again, Share it with people not, not in your organization. Hey, one of the best ways to recruit in 2022, share this type of information like what we shared today on finance or what Joe's going to share on manifesting your success in 2022. Share it with people not in your company, the friends and relatives you're going to see during this holiday season, perhaps, and say, oh, are you still doing that whatever? Are you still selling that skinny powder or that skincare or that whatever? Yeah, hey, I am. Hey, by the way, let me, let me send you something, okay? Send them one of these shows. Let them listen to it and you'll hear that we're just like they are. We just figured out how to get that multiple source of income that they're looking for, that plan B, that side gig, call it what you want. We got it. And this is a nice little way subtly to let them hear some great information. And at the same time say, hey, now tell me about that product that you have because, oh, by the way, yeah, maybe I should get that side gig going in 2022. Thank you so much. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. And, uh, Happy 2022. Thanks so much, Keith. 
thank you for listening to this week's episode of Leave Nothing to Chance. If you want to know more about what it takes to succeed in the network marketing space, join us again next week for another amazing episode. For additional resources and to connect with John Soliter, visit leavingnothingtochance.com. Don't forget to leave a review and we'll see you next time.